hybrid dynamical systems. So please, Eugene, when you're ready. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, what I'm gonna talk about, part of what I'm gonna talk about is joint work with James Schmidt, who was my PhD student and he finished last December. Um, so you might wanna ask him questions too, but he, I don't think he's here. So um, let me start by um, talking about hybrid dynamical systems. I, I sort of assume that most people here know more category theory than I do, which is not hard, but maybe haven't seen too many hybrid dynamical systems. So rather than giving you a formal, so most of the talk will be a discussion of what the definition should really be, rather than me telling you what it is, um, because it's um, a little complicated. And so let me start by talking about one example. So it's a room with a thermostat. And um, so the, the two examples I'm about to give you are standard in hybrid dynamical systems literature. Any tutorial will start with them. So I've decided not to be any different. Um, so what's the setup? So you should imagine an office in an old building like the one I'm in. And there is an air conditioning unit right next to me. Um, so it's summer, it's a little warm. So um, um, I'm gonna model it as a dynamical system. There is only one variable T, the temperature. And say um, my thermostat, my air conditioner, tries to keep the temperature in this range between T0 and T1. Since I'm a mathematician, I'm gonna ignore all the units. Um, and say we start with some temperature less than T1. T1 is supposed to the maximum. So the, the air conditioner is off, the room is heating up, and we're gonna model this by saying that the temperature is growing at you know, one unit per minute or something like that. So here's the differential equation. Um, so that looks like a, or an RDE or continuous time dynamical system. Uh, once T reaches T1, the air conditioning better kick in, so it turns on. And then it starts blowing cold air, so the temperature now is decreasing at this rate. Um, you could put different rates if you want to, you have a different ODE, but it doesn't really matter. And then, so it will continue like this until the temperature drops low enough, say to T0, and then the air conditioner should better shut off. And um, so what do we get? So we get a system like this, we have two. Um, closed intervals with two vector fields. I'm gonna write them as DDT and minus DDT. And we have the so-called reset maps. So whenever you get to this point, um, your dynamical system changes. Your continuous time, then you jump over to this point. So this point gets mapped to this point. Um, so R1 is a map, is a function. It's not defined on all of the interval. It's called so-called partial map. Um, I'm not sure where people call them partial maps, I guess in computer science maybe. Um, so it's defined only on, at one point in this example and it maps into the other interval. And so your evolution goes grow, jump, um, decrease. Once you hit T0, um, you jump back to um, into the other regime and it starts heating up again. So I thought it was a little too small, so I blew it up a little bit. Um, and so um, if you want to encode it, you could sort of see that what we have is a graph like this, where the nodes are decorated with manifolds, with boundary, because I have closed intervals, and I have two partial maps. Uh, one going in one direction and the other one going in the other direction. And um, since partial maps are kind of a pain to work with, I'm gonna think of them as just relations. So take the graph of a partial map, it's going to be a relation on the product. And that's how I'm gonna think about it. Any questions about this example? All right, I'm gonna just move on then. So now suppose we have, um, here's another example that comes from classical mechanics. Um, so 
we have a ball and I'm bouncing it off the floor. So I'm just letting it go. It comes down, bounces, goes back up, and then comes down, goes back up, <clears throat> and so on. So let's try to describe the dynamical system that we're dealing with. I'm going to have, so I'm going to assume that my ball, um, ball moves vertically, so it can only go up and down. And this is not strictly necessary, but I'm just going to keep the dimension of the system down. So then we have two variables, the height of where the ball is and its velocity. And the equations of motions are these. So we have gravity. So the ball, when it goes down, accelerates with the force of gravity, with um, acceleration of gravity. And the change in the height is the velocity of the ball. OK? I'm going to assume that um, the collision with the floor is perfectly elastic. Um, it's not entirely realistic, but um, it makes things simpler uh, because I want to draw the trajectories. Um, and because everything is elastic, the energy is kinetic plus potential is conserved. And so I can solve for velocity, right. And one important point, what happens when the ball hits the floor? Well, at this point, um, the velocity goes from pointing straight down to going straight up. And so if we're in the phase space where you have the height here, velocity here, notice that um, the phase space the, where the motion takes place is a half plane. Again, it's a manifold with boundary in this case. Um, it's the right-hand side. And once you hit the floor, the velocity changes to minus what it was before. So it was pointing down, now it's pointing up. So if I want to draw the trajectory, um, I'll start here. I'll follow. So the height goes down, the velocity goes up. The relation between height and velocity is this one. Just solve the conservation of energy equation. Um, so we have a parabola. And then when we hit the floor, there's again a partial map. It takes this point over here. And it would take this point over here and this point over here. So the partial map, V goes to minus V. So our phase space is, um, is a half plane. We have a vector field in the half plane, this one. And we have a reset map or partial map. It's defined like this. And it takes zero and v to zero minus v. The height doesn't change. Um, questions? Okay. So I'm going to pretend that I was clear, which is always a dangerous thing to do. Um, so let me give you the official definition of a hybrid dynamical system that you uh, may find in one of the textbooks. Um, one word of warning, there are about 200 definitions of hybrid dynamical systems. And the one um, I'm giving you is more along the lines of uh, um, that an engineer would write down as opposed to the one written by computer scientists. Because for engineers, um, for many engineers I know, a hybrid dynamical system is a continuous time system with abrupt transitions. Um, and for a computer scientist, it would be um, something like a label transition system. But now, uh, in, in every node, something happens, some continuous dynamics happens. So they take the, the points and blow them up into regions or manifolds where dynamics will take place. But the, the definition here is the one more like that privileges continuous time dynamics in some sense. So, what's a hybrid dynamical system? It's going to be a direct graph that I'm going to write this way. So A0 is the nodes, vertices A1 are the um, arrows, edges. The two arrows that I wrote here, drew here, are the source and target map for the arrows, for the more, right? And what do we do? To every node, um, we attach a manifold with corners. So in the examples, you saw manifolds with boundary. 
But once you start taking products, the product of two manifold with boundaries, a manifold with corners, and um, even uh, limiting ourselves to manifolds with corners is probably not general enough. And you probably want something more complicated eventually, but people haven't done that. And so I have a manifold with corners, I have a vector field and a manifold with corners, which I'm thinking of a section of the tangent bundle. You could just think of it as an ID if you don't want to think about differential geometry. And for every edge of the graph, I have just a relation between two manifolds, and I'm going to impose no conditions on relations. There's sort of there are set theoretic relations, or if you like, the relations in the category underlying in the category of sets underlying the category of manifolds. And the reason I'm doing this that way is because if you start requiring the relations to be immersed submanifolds or embedded submanifolds or spans of maps of manifolds or something like this, then you have trouble, you start running into trouble with transversality when you try to compose them. And um, I, I don't want to think about that, so I'm just going to take relations. Okay, so that's what a hybrid dynamical system traditionally is defined as. And, um, you know, if, I, I'm, if I'm giving you a dynamical system, I should probably tell you what it does, right? I should tell you about its behavior. So an integral curve, a trajectory, or something like this for a hybrid dynamical system is called an execution. And an execution of a hybrid dynamical system has the following somewhat complicated looking thing. It's an increasing sequence of times. You, uh, people index that sequence by natural numbers or um, integers. In general, it really, I'm going to stick with natural numbers. And then we're going to have a function that assigns to every natural number um, a point in the graph, another function that assigns to every natural number an edge, and that edge should be compatible. It should go, so if I goes into one node, I plus one goes into the other node, then uh, the I should go, that I should go to the edge between these two nodes. Now I'll draw a picture, well, the picture is down here. Um, you could look at it while I'm talking. And then I want integral curves in my manifolds um, of the corresponding vector field. So remember, for every um, right, once we have a node in our graph that's attached to this hybrid dynamical system, we have a phase space, a manifold, and um, I'm calling it R. So sigma should be an integral curve of this vector field inside this manifold. And once we uh, get to the end of the interval, um, my system should undergo a transition. And the transition is defined by the relation that um, we have chosen for our hybrid dynamical system. So here it is. So um, this is why I was giving these two examples here. Are the, so a dynamical system here would be um, a trajectory would be a sequence of intervals, say indexed um, by natural numbers. We go from zero to one, traverse this, um, then jump, then go from one to two, then from three to four, four to five, and so on. I don't know if that is making sense to people or um, um, I should say more. Or should I say last I a question? Yeah. Um, in your examples, the manifolds were manifolds with corners or manifolds with boundaries, and uh, and the reset maps seem to occur when it hit the boundary. Yeah. But there is no requirement of that, right? And you, you yeah, could I'm not putting that into the definition. Uh -huh. But you you could. But I think it just ties your hands. Mm -hmm. And what's the value of using the uh, non-negative reals? Instead um, of so it's if you start with them, sorry, no negative reals. Yeah, if it, what, what, what's the difference between, say, using the non negative reals and the. You mean integers versus natural numbers? 
Oh, no, no, for the, in your cases above, um, for the bouncing ball, say, or the, or the thermostat, for using the interval or the non, -neg let's say the third, let's say the thermostat, what's, what's better about using the closed interval T0, T1 versus just the whole reels and still having the same reset maps? Oh, you could that, do that too. Okay. So that, yes, you could do that too. You could take, you could mark two points on the real line. Um, it will be a little hard to interpret what happens if you start outside the interval. All uh, right. Okay. That's helpful. And so it was probably easier to think about not having anything else outside that interval. Gotcha. Right. And the same thing, um, you know, I'm not, I'm thinking that um, here's the floor and I'm not worried about the ball being below the floor. That makes sense. Thanks. Well, so that's why the manifolds with boundary and corners coming in. Can I ask a question about, about this last bit about getting outside the range? There's no requirement that if the dynamical system hits a point in the domain of one of the reset, of the appropriate reset relation, it has to reset. It could, an execution could just keep right on going and ignore the available. Right, so that's another, okay, so thank you for reminding me. Um, another reason why I set up the uh, intervals the way I did is that it would have to, if it were to continue, it would have to jump. And uh, one other thing I'm sort of sneaking in here, if you look at this definition, it's really an under, a non-deterministic system. Um, it's um, some of my engineering friends are unhappy with that, but I think it just makes it easier to set things up. And then you could always assert that in the case you're staring at or check, your system is deterministic. So this is why I'm doing things this way. In any case, I'm gonna abandon this definition um, and give you a different one. So the question is, um, now how do we turn um, a hybrid dynamical system in the category? And um, given the, where the talk is taking place, I will not try to explain why I'm asking this question. I hope I can get away with that. Um, so um, there, there have been several attempts to do that. Um, Aaron Ames did it in his thesis a while back um, at UC Berkeley. And I think there were other attempts, but um, I'm just gonna pretend it didn't happen. Um, unfortunately, it's being recorded, so people will get offended. All right, um, let me ask a different question. How do you turn a continuous time dynamical system into a category? Well, there, there is actually a standard answer to that. Uh, so I wanna give you a standard answer and a non-standard answer. The standard answer is um, a continuous time dynamical system is a pair, a manifold and a vector field. And I'm gonna stop saying manifolds with corners and just pretend that all manifolds always have corners if they need to. Um, and a morphism from one manifold with a vector field to another manifold with a vector field is a smooth map between manifolds. Everything is C infinity in my setting because I don't particularly worry about regularity. I don't want to worry about regularity. And the vector fields are related by this equation. So if you think in terms of um, diagrams, right, here's the map between manifolds. Here's one vector field. I can go up, I can go over where the differential of my map F, or I can go over and go up by the vector field. Um, they are, people say the X and Y and X are F related. Um, another word that gets used in dynamical system is semi-conjugacy. I guess conjugacy is reserved when F is a diffeomorphism. Um, so we have a category, the objects are, manifolds and pairs and morphisms and maps satisfying the condition. A um, couple of remarks. First of all, an integral curve um, of a map, an integral curve of a dynamical system is a smooth map, right? It will go from an integral to the manifold um, satisfying this condition. Um, usually, it's with, this is a fancy way of writing gamma dot. A derivative of gamma is the value of the vector field at the point gamma of t. I want to write it this way because then we can see that integral curves 
amorphisms in the category of dynamical systems. And that's useful because then if I have two related vector fields and I have an integral curve of the first one, composing with the map between them will give me an integral curve in the other one because we have a category. Um, there's a forgetful functor from dynamical systems to manifolds. You could just forget the vector fields. Um, I, I don't think this functor has any lifting properties. I don't think it's either vibration or not vibration. Um, but um, I want to think of this guy as a category of elements sitting over the category of manifolds. And um, take the worst category of elements with quotation marks around them. So I want to give you a functor, right? So um, given a manifold, I can assign to the vector space of all vector fields. Um, and um, if I have a map between manifolds, I don't get a linear map between vector fields, but I do get a relation, right? Because this is, I get the related vector fields. And so I can get a functor from the category of manifolds to the category, well, I guess secretly it's a two category, whose objects are manifold, um, are vector spaces, morphisms of linear relations, right? You could check that, um, and the two morphisms are inclusions of linear, linear relations. And you actually do need the two categorical structure because this guy is not strictly speaking a functor. It's a lax two functor and because of the following. Right? If I have two maps between manifolds, and um, so, right, so the relation that I assign to a map is just pairs of related vector fields. Um, I don't think this is standard, but for some reason, I find that useful to think about things that way. And um, you quickly discover that if you compose two maps and look at the related vector fields, vector fields related by the composite, it will include this composition of relations, but it's not usually not equal. So you honestly have a lax two functor. And um, so we're, I'm pretending that this is a two category with no two arrows. And then um, you can think of, um, you can associate to this functor a category of elements, um, right? Uh, because if you stare at how the morphisms between dynamical systems are defined, they're exactly this, right? They're smooth maps satisfying this condition. X, Y sits in the, in the relation. So you can think of it as a relation applied to X gives you Y. So what I wanna do is try something similar for hybrid systems. So let's try the following definition. Um, so the point I'm emphasizing here, we thought of dynamical systems, continuous time dynamical systems as, some, as something sitting over the category of manifolds. So the category of hybrid dynamical systems should sit over some category. Uh, I don't wanna call them hybrid manifolds. I'm just gonna call them hybrid phase spaces. Hybrid manifolds is overused. So, um, so let's look at the um, category I'm gonna call it real man. I'm gonna make it bigger later. Um, it's a category whose objects are manifolds and whose morphisms are set theoretic relations. It's a two category, um, but the two category structure will not matter much. And eventually I wanna puff it up to a double category. And then the two category structure will be there for free. So what's a hybrid phase space? It's a graph together with a map of graphs from my graph A to the um, graph underlying the category of manifolds, uh, uh, real man. Right, so I could define it that way. So the idea is um, if I have a graph, um, I'm gonna assign to it a pair of manifolds and a relation between them. So this is A, here's B, here's gamma, 
There's R array, sorry. So a map of graphs, let's call it R. Here's R of gamma, and here's R of B. Which is, I think, what I was writing earlier. Um, I haven't told you what the morphism should be. It should be some sort of natural transformations. Right? Um, well, sorry. I have maps of graphs, so I don't have natural transformations into maps of graphs. I sort of gave away half of the game. Um, but let me drop this for a moment how you would define morphisms. And let's just see if this makes any sense. Right? Suppose you have two rooms with two thermostats. Um, then I should be take, and then the, um, the phase space, the hybrid phase space should be the product of two maps of graphs, right? And so um, we're in the category of graphs, so products are taken pointwise, right? And the product of a graph like this with a graph like this is going to be the graph with four vertices, but we're only going to have two arrows. And if you think about what that's telling you, this is really trouble, right? And the dots are going to be decorated with squares. So another reason why I told you that we'll need math all the corners really, really soon. But this, there is something weird about what we've just done. And um, if you ever mucked around with label transition systems, you could sort of see where the mistake occurred. I don't know if anybody in the audience has. Um, right? What does it really tell you? It tells you that, right, so every arrow is a switch from thermostat being, air conditioners being on to air conditioners being off or, and, and the other way around, right? And that just says that the only way we can go from, the only possible transitions we could have is either two air conditioners kicking in at the same time or two air, air conditioners shutting off at the same time. And that's just not right. I have, uh, if I have a house with two rooms, I have two air conditioners, I turn them on, I walk out, the door may be open and closed, maybe there is air circulating between them. You could never synchronize the two air conditioners, right? So um, that doesn't look right. So there is something wrong with the definition I gave you. Um, so let's try to fix it. And um, the fix um, that I'm going to suggest is that we have an adjunction between graphs and categories. And remember, we already had this functor showing up in the definition. So maybe we, we should really use this functor to define hybrid phase spaces. So let's try a hybrid phase space as a functor like this. I have a graph. I take a free category on that graph, and um, I map, and then I take a functor instead of a map of graphs. Um, it looks like nothing has changed, right? Because we have an adjunction. But notice that the, um, something interesting happens with products. Because if I take a free graph on this graph and multiply it, but a free category on this graph and a free category on this graph. It's not a free category on the product. It's going to be a free category on this graph. And now we have a lot more transitions that are allowed, right? So that just says that one AC could be off and the other one can, kick, can turn itself on and we'll transition this way. Or they could do it at the same time. Or maybe the other one can do the transition. So now they can do things independent of each other. And so this looks like a good way to do things. And Michael Warren persuaded me that um, sticking to a free category, there is absolutely no reason to stick to free categories on graphs. It's just trying to be faithful to the original definition. So let's just chuck that and define the hybrid phase space to be a functor. Um, and there is a paper here, so I'll fix it. So uh, it's a functor from 
some category, indexing category, to the category of manifolds with corners and set their other correlations. Um, next issue is morphisms. And the idea is that you want to define morphisms in such a way that executions, um, so whenever you have a map between dynamical system, there is an, an underlying map on phase spaces. So whenever I have an execution of a hybrid dynamical system, there is an underlying map on hybrid phase spaces, or there should be. So that just says, forget the vector fields. So let's forget the vector fields and stare at the executions. So executions were things like this. So there is an integral curve, jump, integral curve, where, um, which really means this. Right, let me show, right? So um, now that we have um, hybrid phase spaces, I can tell you what the domain of the execution is. And it's a hybrid phase space that looks like this. It's a bunch of intervals. And when you get to the end of one interval, you jump to the next interval. And, I, and, I, and you actually do see pictures like that in um, hybrid dynamical systems literature. And then um, what's an execution or the map underlying the execution? It should be a map of hybrid phase spaces taking a collection of these intervals and jumps to a collection of maps of manifolds. Right, so this interval goes here, it's an integral curve. This jump is a um, very simple reset map or one point relation, and it should go into a relation. Right, so if I get to the end of my manifold and here's my re reset relation or reset map that takes points from here to here, I'll just jump. So that suggests the following definition. So given two functors, right, which are, um, which are objects, which are our hybrid phase spaces, a morphism from this guy to this guy should be a functor between indexing categories. And um, I put quotation marks around the word natural transformation. So what would it do? It will assign to every um, uh, object of the first and the same category, a smooth function, right? And now you see that I'm sort of doing apples and oranges, right? This doesn't live in the category of real men. It's not a morphism in real men. So something funny is going on, right? Because I need these maps. I need to have integral curves and their maps of manifolds. And um, what's the compatibility condition? The compatibility condition is that for every arrow in the first indexing category, I should have the following square. But this square is not a commuting square because a morphism running, arrows running this way are smooth maps of manifolds with corners, and arrows running this way are relations. And the condition on the square should be this one, that if I apply this pair of smooth maps gives, takes a relation, which is a subset of the product to this relation, which is a subset of the product of these two guys, right? And um, if you see that, um, your reaction is, well, it's not a natural transformation. Um, so what's going on? Uh, the point is something I've been sort of telling you, but haven't spelled out is that manifolds, smooth functions and arbitrary relations form a double category. I'm gonna put a little square up here just to remind me that it's a double category, right? And um, I asked Tim when I was invited to give a talk if people, um, are comfortable with double categories. Um, and he told me to quickly remind people, right? So let me remind you what a double category is. 
Um, there are various ways of thinking about them. Um, but I guess if you haven't seen them before, um, the most down to earth way to think about them is a double category has objects. It has two types of one arrows um, that are often called vertical and horizontal. And then it has tiles or squares like this. Right? So one type of error goes horizontally, another type of error goes vertically. And then tiles can be composed in two ways. You can stick them together horizontally, or you can stick them together vertically and you should get a new tile. You basically erase the, the middle part. And the two compositions should commute. Right? You can, if you compose, if you take four squares, compose them this way, compose them this way. It's the same as composing them this way and this way, and then composing them horizontally. Right? And, um, and if you stare at the um, category of manifolds and relations and smooth maps, it is a double category in this um, primitive description. You can also think of um, double categories as categories internal to cat, uh, but that sort of biases one direction over the other. And I forget which one over which. And I guess you can do either. Um, so these double categories has been, have been around since 1950s, I think. They're due to Erasmus. Um, the, um, there is a notion of a functor. Basically, it has to take squares to squares, tiles to tiles. It has to preserve composition, both compositions of tiles. They're weak and, um, and they're strict and weak versions of functors that I don't want to go into, mostly because the functors we're looking at are strict, so I don't need to. And um, oh yes, my notes say any ordinary one category can be made into a double category where you can think of an arrow between two objects as a very, very thin tile, or if you like, you can decorate vertical arrows all identity maps. You can do them this way, right? You could just take commuting squares like this. And there are two types of natural transformations, vertical and horizontal. And they can never keep them straight. Um, so I'm just gonna ignore the issue of which one is vertical and which one is horizontal. But here's the concrete definition. We want this. We want that. So this guy can be interpreted as a natural transformation as long as you take the target of these functors to be um, double categories, not ordinary categories, or two categories. So here's the definition of a category of hybrid phase spaces. Um, so the objects are going to be double functors from some indexing categories. You could take them to be small. Um, you probably should take them to be small. And I think in most cases, they're at, best, at most countable. There is no reason for them to be uncountable. Um, and um, real man is the double category of manifolds with functions and relations. And the morphisms are two commuting triangles like this. Right, so it, it's a pair consisting of a functor between indexing categories and a natural transformation. And this triangle has to, to commute. And if you spell out what that means, um, if I didn't make any mistake, you, get, you end up with this. That's, that's what the definition should, should, should boil down to. But it's useful to think about it in a more succinct, succinct way. Now, how do we turn it into where are the dynamical systems? Um, well, there is a forgetful functor from hybrid phase spaces to manifolds. So given one of these functors, um, the corresponding manifold is just the disjoint union of the manifolds you assign to, to vertices or to the objects of your indexing category. And um, and whenever you have this two commuting triangle, you get an induced map between the coproducts. And just from the universal property of coproducts. 
Um, so now we can take this forgetful functor, or get tons of forgetful functors, and compose it with the um, functor that assigns the manifold of vector fields. And then we just take the category of elements of this functor. And so the end result is what have we done? Well, um, not much, right? With this definition, a hybrid dynamical system is going to be um, a collection of manifolds, a collection of reset maps between these manifolds, and a vector field on every manifold. Um, from the category theoretic point of view, I'm going to go about nine minutes fast. I'm going to finish early. Right, what do we get? We get um, a diagram like this between various categories. Right, so let me blow it up. Um, we have a category of hybrid dynamical systems. And there is a forgetful functor to hybrid phase spaces. So this category is the new thing. And I guess this definition is not entirely standard. Um, you have another forgetful functor. You can forget resets. You end up in the category of manifolds. Or you could have started with hybrid dynamical systems, which is manifolds, resets, and vector fields, and just forgot all the resets. So once your vector field hits the boundary, it has no place to go. Right? Then you just get an ordinary dynamical system. And this diagram commutes. And I guess it is a fiber product of these two. Right? You can think of it as a fiber product of these guys. Um, so I guess that looks like an amusing exercise if you like category theory. Um, but so what is it for? Well, I wanted to understand what hybrid open systems are. And um, so to do that, I really needed to understand products of hybrid phase spaces. So I wanted this category to be a category with products. Um, and um, the other thing I was going to mention in the remaining seven or eight minutes but I really don't have seven and eight minutes to say is that there is a, um, I can go on and describe what I mean by this later or when I'm answering questions. Um, there is a possible drawback to this setup, right? So um, by training, I'm more of a differential geometer. And um, I've, when I was young, I was mucking around with Hamiltonian systems. So of course, math, our vector fields are more important to me than everything else. Um, so in the setup I've just described, you can fix the hybrid phase space in various vector fields. You get new dynamical, you can perturb vector fields, which is a very useful thing to do. But there is no way to perturb resets. And you probably do want to be able to do that. Um, Right. But the, the definition I gave you bakes them into the definition of a hybrid phase space. Um, so James Schmidt, who was my student, um, was not happy with what I was doing. It's the best kind of student one can have. And so he, try, um, he um, thought very hard about how to make the resets vary as well. And that's in his PhD thesis in, from 2019. It's in the archive. So if you Google James Schmidt or look at our joint paper and then click um, on his name, you'll see his thesis. And you can see how he does that. And um, I'm gonna stop here. If that's okay with David. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Eugene. So people um, can unmute and ask questions, or you can raise your hand with the uh, reactions button. Um, maybe to kick, oh, go ahead, David. Um, hi, Eugene, thank you. This is uh, 
This is great. Um, I was wondering uh, about how you think about this model. So you have this um, this this graph, and then you uh, decorate it with these uh, sort of um, phase spaces for each node, and then you have this sort of uh, the, the, the reset relation for each edge. Um, uh, is do you think about the graph as playing sort of a conceptual role in the design of the system? Like we have a transition system represented by this graph. And then in each of those sort of um, states of that transition system, we have this continuous dynamics. Or do you think of it as more just a way of allowing us to make these discontinuous jumps? Well, um, I think which so the one point of view of hybrid dynamical systems is timed automata. And I think that's what you're referring to, where actually instead of a graph that you have a labeled transition system, and then nodes get blown up into some domains, some regions in space with vector fields. So people have thought about it that way. I, I'm agnostic. Um, what I wanted to do is something else. Okay, so this is so you so you think so. So I, I I the label transition system. I didn't mean to confuse. I meant your graph I, uh -huh. um, there, um, which I quickly turned into a category. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, right. Um, I, it's part of the structure of the system. Right. I, I guess I'm wondering. Um, so, for example, for the thermostat, I could imagine you thinking like this is a two-state machine yes. that alternates states. It's either increasing the temperature mm -hmm. or letting the temperature decrease. Yes. Um, but for the bouncing ball, I would kind of think like, I don't want to have to think there are two states that this ball is in. It's either falling down or bouncing up. I want to think of it as a single thing. It just happens to have a discontinuous shift in behavior in the middle. Does, does that sort of distinction make sense? Um, yes, and people do like to make that distinction. And so, so there are many different communities working hybrid dynamical systems, and they come from different parts of science and engineering. So there are time automata on one side, and then there are people who are working on um, discontinuous dynamical systems. So for them, uh, they would just have a region of Rn and a bunch of vector fields that are not smooth everywhere, but they have sort of boundaries. And when you cross the boundary, the vector field changes drastically. And they have complicated dynamics. So that's another way you can think about those things. Thanks. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I'm trying to say there are many different points of view, and I picked a particular one for for, for another for a reason. And um, if you look at the paper that James Schmidt and I wrote, you could see what the reason was. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, could I comment on the last part of that question? Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the bouncing ball, my my mental picture of the situation is that there is one state, so the graph has a single node. Yes. And an edge from that to itself. Yes, that's, it that's, that's how I was presenting it to you. So there isn't any ascending or descending state. There's just... No. There's just one manifold with one particular dynamics, but once you run into the boundary, something happens. And one, one yeah, and thank you. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Thank you. And uh, things like this happen all the time if you're trying to model a walking robot. Right, because policy balls get um, quickly upgraded to pendula that bounce off the ground or a collection of pendula, or, and then you have a walking machine. And it's a, it goes, that would have many different states depending on how many feet you have on the ground. Thanks. So I had a related question. Um, in, if I had some kind of convenient category of Manifolds. Um, oh, it's asking me for the password. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so that I could like take co limits and things like that. Yeah. Um, so maybe, like, maybe, I don't know what it would be, diffeological spaces or something like that. And I just um, blew. There, I just, there is a, sorry, I'm going to jump up. You don't want diffeological spaces because they don't have very good dynamics. So what goes wrong if I if I try to just you glue? wouldn't know how what a vector field is and how to integrate it. What if I said I, I always know what my coordinate charts are? So I, I define something by uh, coordinate charts, and so I have a co. I appreciate you have a sheaf over the category of opens, and it's probably not the best way for vector fields. 
because you don't have the tangent functor, or at least nobody has written it down. I think if you go the way of um, synthetic differential geometry and work with the book office, you're better off. Uh huh. Okay. And there, would I just, I could just, instead of doing all this reset stuff, I could just take the co-limit of my, of your reset diagram and just have, have dynamics in that co-limit? Um, you probably want to take a homotopy co-limit. Okay. I'll take a homotopy co-limit. And this is what um, Aaron Ames tried to do in his thesis. Uh-huh. He, he set things up so it would be easy for him to take homotopy co-limits. Yes, I remember that of these, vaguely. Of these spaces, hybrid spaces. But and, and so what didn't you like about, I mean, if, if you don't mind commenting what uh, you were trying to avoid. In public there. on record. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, I'll, I'll just quote somebody else. So, um, or, or what were you trying to do? What, 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 why shouldn't I follow? I don't know. Yeah, because somehow that would avoid some of the complication. I'd get to just have a single space and not have to switch around and stuff. No, you why shouldn't I do that? Well, you wouldn't necessarily have a single space, or you can have. So, um, sorry. If your graph was connected, you'll end up with a single space, right? Right, but um, in any case, so there are a number of issues that are going on, and I'm not sure which one to tackle first. Um, so in um, Aaron's thesis, he spends a long time giving a complicated definition of a directed graph. So he defines a category of directed graphs that doesn't look at all like a category of directed graphs, and then he proves it's equivalent. I think I remember him like taking the growth and deconstruction of your category of directed graphs. So, so you, would, you would have like the edges pointing at both of their yes, target yes, things. Yeah. yeah, something like that, but why? I mean, well, I mean, that, that was for the, the real, relations were sitting in those uh, edge nodes kind of. Yeah, I think it's just, he was trying, when you take um, homotopy co-limits, right? You don't replace objects, you start replacing maps. And he wanted to um, replace objects. And I think mm -hmm. that's how, why he set things up that way. Mm -hmm. but, but, but that's my but, guess. But, but his thesis aside, um, if I just want to use the, the book topos or- uh, Okay, so I should probably yeah. talk, David, because okay, I've talk on later. something related to that. Okay. Um, the, um, you see, if you work with the book topos, it's still not clear to me how to integrate vector fields. Mm. And you don't exactly have a Duran complex either. I don't know if anybody has written it down. Um, um, there, is, there is a related approach to singular spaces. Right, but um, the question about synthetic differential geometry, there are experts in the audience. What's an integral curve? And what's a flow uh, in synthetic differential geometry? I just haven't seen them. Oh, is this, a, is this a question? Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that in synthetic differential geometry, everything is infinitesimal. And uh, so a vector field is, so the tangent space is um, the functions from the infinitesimal line. Right, yes. Um, and so a, a flow, if you want, in, in general, or a vector field is a function uh, from, uh, x to x to the d, but that's the same as d cross x to x. Um, the section condition just says that if you plug in zero, you'll get the identity. So flows and, and vector fields are the same. Uh, uh, and then, sorry, I, I'm David, I'm, I'm confused. David Jazz. Um, sorry. There are many Davids here. Um, do I actually get a map from an interval? I'm sorry. There, is there, if I start with a vector field? Yes. Do I actually get a map from an interval of non-zero length? Do you actually get a map from what? He's saying, from can you, can, can you interval. get the trajectory as, as a map from the interval to the thing? So I guess, uh, yeah. As a, as a, can you get the trajectory, like, can you uniquely solve an ODE? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Oh, yes, for manifold, for manifold-like spaces, yes. Not, not so if it's, what if it's uh, something much worse? Huh? What if it's not, I mean, if it's a manifold, sure, we know what to do with any synthetic differential geometry, but if I have something much more complicated. 
Uh, oh, wait, so, no, maybe not something very complicated. Like I said, uh, so, I'll also, so the class, so uh, the the class of objects you can do, it, it is more complicated than a manifold. It's in fact, it's in fact the the left right saturation of the class of maps. Uh, take the map from R to the point, and then left saturate it, and then right saturate it, and everything uh, in here is. Sorry, um, let me just tell you what I would want. That R satisfies. So right? you, if I have a manifold in a vector field. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. So that that includes um, uh, not like uh, arbitrary function spaces between manifolds. It includes arbitrary uh, varieties. In in other words, mm -hmm. solutions to smooth equations, um, and it, it, it's closed under limits. So it's a lot of stuff. It's more than just manifolds. It includes okay. manifolds with corners and and all sorts of stuff as well. Maybe we could maybe you could explain it to me one day. Sure. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to say is that if I have this, I'll have a subset of m cross r open and the map which is the flow and secretly we get a group one a lead group one So that's what an integration of a flow of a vector field for me is. Okay. Um, so can I get a group one? Uh, I, I, let me. Um, so it's a group word integration in algebra that's defined by the vector field. I, I'm not sure I understand what what is the relationship that that, that phi has to x. Oh. Um, DDT of V of X T is X and V of X T. Right. So you can express that formula just as well in synthetic differential geometry. It, it's right. So this is integration of an algebra, right? And I want this. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't see what the abstract, you just do it the exact same way. In fact, the, the it's even easier because you just don't have to check anything to submersion to check that you can form the pullbacks you need to describe the leak report structure. Mm -hmm. So the exact same formulas will work. It, and, and in fact, the same formulas will work, but you never have to check smoothness because everything is necessarily smooth. So uh, right. uh, it, it should all work in the exact same way. Yeah. Um, okay, the existence right. of solutions uh, is... Um, uh, again, it's a wider class than, than manifold. I, I could mm -hmm. we could talk about this later. It also, but it's a wider class than manifold. But it includes any any function spaces. It's closed mm -hmm. under. It's closed. It's an exponential ideal. So if you have mm -hmm. something in there, it's closed mm -hmm. under taking maps into it. So okay. R is in there. I'd love to hear more about that. And then and then you can and then it's closed under taking limits and it closed under it mm -hmm. carving out equations and stuff like that. Okay, well, maybe we should we should see if there's any other questions for Eugene, and then we can uh, close things and talk about things like that afterwards or another time. But that's that's exciting. Let me make a comment about the idea of of just taking co-limits of these manifolds along the graph. If some of your reset relations are are real relations as opposed to partial functions then you could have a situation where the trajectory comes along and hits a place where it can reset, but has a choice of which way to reset. And I think the co-limit of that is, is going to be something that's, uh, that's worse than a manifold with corners, sort of a manifold with bifurcations in it. And in particular, you won't be able to expect unique solutions of differential equations, if you can talk about differential equations at all on such a thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but you could probably make sense of trajectories. Yes, so you could have a non-deterministic notion of trajectory that any of the choices counts. Yes. Well, hello. Another thought along those lines is, uh, you know, coming from literature in the electrical engineering field, 
say, uh, uh, perhaps starting with uh, literature on the Van der Poel oscillator, uh, the jumps, the system with jumps, is see is is viewed as well uh, 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 an analytic limit of you know smooth dynamical system where uh, you know a reactive uh, parameter, say a capacitance, which determines a relaxation time, uh, goes to zero. Say, consider a, uh, uh, well, uh, what what is it like a, uh, 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 you know, the the uh, the. Uh, uh, basically, the the the, the uh, a small capacitance, the relaxation time for a, uh, uh, you know, exponential decay for uh, of, of the time is equal to the you know, of a resistor capacitor in series. The relaxation time is R C. As C goes to zero. Uh, that time goes to zero, and then in analyses of the Van der Poel oscillator, a uh, you know the the uh, you know the nonlinear equation has a parameter corresponding to a capacitance, and then the discontinuous behavior is the re- is the is the limit as that capacitance parameter uh, goes to zero. So uh, 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 the same thought, the same the same uh, su- suggestion that was just given uh, by Andres uh, that uh, that that we might consider the uh, the uh, uh, the hybrid dynamical system from a category th- point of view as a co-limit. Of smooth dynamical systems, uh, but what uh, what what see might be tricky is that you know in the case of a uh, you look at the smooth dynamical system containing a uh, you know a region that uh, where where the uh, where the uh, where the derivatives are are large, and the derivatives get larger and larger as the parameter goes to zero. Uh, so the the uh, yeah, so then the uh, you know the new system that it transitions to is like embedded into the old system. But in your in your model, with the relation, the system that the that's transitions to is a different system. Well, I'm wondering if here's basically the idea that the analysis done uh, for the Van der Poel oscillator and similar uh, systems from electrical engineering can be translated into a co-limit construction, uh, taking the co-limit of smooth systems in some sense. You will not be surprised by my answer that I don't know. Ah, well, you know, that might be an interesting uh, direction for research, yes. because the you know, the the uh, electrical engineers and others have seen. But they they also know about hybrid dynamical systems. Yes, yes, but you know, one could you know look at the model of a hybrid dynamical system where the where the uh, the jumps are built in with things like switches but ultimately every switch every every physical device every everything physical is ultimately uh at least in the classical view smooth and that it's particularly noticeable in in the electrical circuits that uh, the jumps that are designed into circuits like flip-flops uh, are not really, you know, instantaneous, but that the parameters of the the uh, 
the feedback is 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 uh, designed to be enough so that the the transitions are uh, are small are, are short enough for the application to be successful can i make a comment i, I think okay. there's a version if i understand what seth is saying correctly big gifts is i'm about to stop electrical engineering and i think there's a version that's more easily understood by this folks like me Go back to the bouncing ball example. When that ball hits the ground and bounces back up, if you look really, really closely at that, what's happening really is that the ball is getting squished and then re-expands and bounces up. So there's a brief moment there where the ball is actually not just instantaneously, but for a short interval of time in contact with the floor, <laughs> subject to a somewhat different differential equation because of this a squishing and bounce and expanding again. And I think what Seth is saying is that the bouncing ball is just the limit of the bouncing ball as described in the talk is the limit of this squish and expand thing as the squish and expand happens over shorter and shorter intervals or as the uh, <laughs> as your softball turns into a hard ball or whatever. Um, and I, I think that I think that's another instance of the same phenomenon. That if you look very closely at instantaneous phenomena, you can either they are physically some slightly extended in time phenomena, or even if they aren't, you can throw in an extra term in your differential equations and then let that go to zero and try to approximate instantaneous resets with um, smooth dynamical resets uh, yes indeed there's a you know one-dimensional parameter that uh, uh, that characterizes shall we say the squishiness of the ball that determines the uh, the uh, the time of rebounds for a given uh, you know, for a given uh, uh, level of drop I guess there's also in these robotic systems, there's these signals that get sent instantaneously and you want the dynamics to change, not because of the uh, physics of the ball, but because I guess, as you said, you know, some electricity is being sent and you could zoom in, but then you have to model something very difficult to model compared to this instantaneous switch. Is that the idea, Eugene, of wh why we'd want the- Yes, I mean, to simplify things, not to make them more complicated. Uh -huh. I think if you understand the simpler system first, you have it. <laughs> and even simple systems become complicated very quickly. I have a suggestion for a simple system for the bouncing ball. Uh, a, uh, a mass uh, with a spring attached to its bottom. And the you know both of them are be uh, be classical models. The spring obeys Hooke's law, and then you take as the uh, the stiffness of the spring uh, goes to infinity. In other words, you ma you model a bouncing ball not by a, a squishy thing, but a uh, a a uh, uh, you know a uh, an ideal mass. Uh, falling with a with an ideal spring uh, attached to the bottom, and I bet that you know that's a really you know the the uh, the, the very easy to analyze analyze it uh, uh, as a physics problem, and then take the limit as the spring constant uh, goes to infinity. Great. Any other questions for Eugene? Okay, well, if not, why don't we thank Eugene again and... Uh, yeah, very cool. Thank you. We'll turn off the recording and the live stream. And then if anybody has any more questions, uh, mm -hmm. 